Welcome. Uh, welcome to our fellows online lecture series. This is sponsored by AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, the AMSSM Education Committee, and the AMSSM Fellowship Committee. I'm Dr. Melody Rubish. I have the honor and pleasure of moderating this topic on endocrinology. Let's see. For the athletes. And we are honored to have Dr. Emily Krauss speak on this subject. She's an expert in this for many reasons. I do want to remind you guys, we do this weekly on Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we have braces, protective, and sports-specific equipment. And it was such an awesome topic. We actually have two main speakers. We have Dr. Dan Herman and Dr. Anna Waterbrook. They're both going to speak on this subject together. And the moderator is Dana Shang. So these lectures are serving as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming. The goal is to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with experienced AMSSM members and at times invited guest experts in a variety of formats. And this should assist in your CAQ exam prep. Please mute your device microphone and turn off your video. Please submit any questions you have through the chat function. You can include your name and program if you wish. Um, I will be keeping an eye on those and collating them and getting the ones that are, I think might be coming in more frequently and we'll be able to try to get those to Dr. Krauss at the end of her lecture. I will ask those questions um, based on what you submit. And then after the program, please complete the evaluation, which will be sent at the end of the lecture, because that's really helpful. We can give those um, to our lecture, but also we can use those to help guide our next planning. Dr. Emily Krauss is a clinical assistant professor at Stanford Children's Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Center, trained in the specialty of physical medicine and rehabilitation sports medicine. She has research and clinical interests in endurance sports medicine, injury prevention, running biomechanics, prevention of bone stress injuries, and the promotion of health and wellness at any age of life. Dr. Krauss is the director of the FASTER program, which stands for Female Athlete Science and Translational Research. The FASTER program seeks to help close the gender gap in sports science research with an emphasis on early identification and interventions to prevent injury and identify ways to optimize performance in female athletes. Dr. Krauss is also a member of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee Women's Health Task Force and is the medical director of the Stanford Children's Motion Analysis and Sport Performance Lab. She has completed nine marathons, including Boston, twice, and one 50K ultra marathon. With running and staying physically active as one of her personal passions, she recognizes the importance of fitness for overall well being and the prevention of chronic medical conditions. So I don't know if you're ready to listen to all of that or not, but I'm super excited to hear from somebody so experienced and so passionate about this topic. So all we'll right. have Dr. Krauss share her screen. Okay. Here and here. Are we set? Okay. Um, well, Melody, thank you so much for the introduction. Very kind. Um, and I love your festive background. It's um, inspiring me to, to do much of the same. Um, hopefully we get some time for a uh, that show later. So stay tuned. Maybe that's some incentive to stay, stay until the end. Um, so I am excited to talk about endocrinology for the athlete. And I'm really hone in and target on what, what does a sports medicine physician need to know regarding endocrinology for athletes? And please keep in mind questions along the way, put them in the chat function. I'll try and stay on time and keep track of time throughout this. So I have no conflicts of interest. However, through the FASTER program, I received financial support from the Joe and Clara Sai Foundation as part of the WUSAI Human Performance Alliance. Melody gave already a great um, introduction, but um, just to share again, um, I grew, I was born and raised in a small town in Nebraska called Holdridge, went to University of Nebraska Lincoln and Nebraska Medical Center, and then made my way over to Stanford, where I studied physical medicine and rehabilitation, and then also stayed on for my sports medicine fellowship. I'm a runner, I'm a cyclist, and um, I've been really excited to dive into um, directing a female athlete research program um, that just started the last year, year and a half. So a few other important disclosures. 
I'm not an endocrinologist and I'm not going to try to or pretend to be one right now, but I do see a lot of sports endocrinology cases in my clinic. And so I think that's an important um, consideration that maybe it's not even on our radar half the time. So um, I want to give a shout out to um, some incredible mentors that um, have guided me along my way. And I think that's just important for you to find the mentors that, that really work um, that work for you um, based on what you're seeing in your clinical practice and also uh, what maybe potential research you're involved with. And this is a combination of both um, researchers, coaches, um, Dr. Ackerman, among many of you know, is the program director for the female athlete program at Harvard Boston Children's. Um, Dr. Tony Hackney is an exercise physiologist and a hormone researcher. Dr. Kirstie Elliott Sale is also um, a PhD and does a lot of research on menstrual cycle. And Dr. Trent Stellingworth um, does a lot of work. He's a coach and exercise physiologist. So big shout out to them. And then we also um, do a um, Stanford Harvard um, fellowship curriculum that's um, been really um, exciting to dive into initially with um, Dr. Ackerman and um, share some of her expertise and, and learn from some of um, our, our combined speakers. So I wanted to, um, I liked this diagram of what sports endocrinology could entail. And um, it's nice to know where you could go in this 45 minutes, although I won't be able to go all of these places in the next 45 minutes. And I'm really gonna focus on some of the key um, key points. Um, and as Melody, you astutely highlighted before we started, make sure um, we get the, the high hitting or the most important areas um, for you all so that you're really proficient in this area or at least at a starting point, and then you can dive in a little bit um, more afterwards. And then um, I think it's nice to look at the various levels of endocrine intervention for performance enhancement in sport, and also how this um, can start both, um, both at the basic level all the way to a quaternary level um, with um, either misuse of hormones or overdiagnosis. And again, um, I will not get into some of those, those kind of interesting and more compelling topics today, just for the sake of time. So let's dive into a case. So this is a case of irregular periods. Um, there's a, I had a, a 20 year old female soccer player who presents to my clinic um, with secondary amenorrhea. And we'll get into that definition in a moment. She does endorse a history of disordered eating, um, which she admits was due to inadvertent under fueling in high school. So she transitioned from JV to varsity, training had changed. Um, she wasn't um, able to stay on top of her fueling. She was getting um, going to morning practices, um, skipping breakfast. So she worked um, really diligently with a sports dietitian and reports that, and also consulting and chatting with the sports dietitian, that this athlete has been at an energy balance for the past two years. And so she feels like she's really been fueling well, and she comes to clinic and is asking, why do I still have irregular periods? So um, some initial labs revealed um, low FSH, a normal high LH, and low normal estradiol um, to start. So I get variations of this in my clinic often, where athletes are confused because they do have irregular menstrual cycles, but they feel like they're they're on top of their nutrition. And they're like, Dr. Cross, I don't have an eating disorder. I don't think I'm, I think I'm fueling really well. Sometimes the more you, um, the deeper you dive, you do realize that they're maybe fueling too clean, um, is what the parents usually say. They're a really clean eater. Uh, but in this case, um, I think it was important to take that slightly deeper dive and figure out why maybe this athlete was having irregular cycles. So to just break down some menstrual cycle irregularities so that we're on the same page when I um, talk about amenorrhea. So a normal menstrual cycle in those, those first couple of years is when an athlete um, has a first period before the age of 15. Menstrual cycles are highly variable um, in those, especially in those first um, few years, um, up to five years, actually. Um, where they can vary from between 21 and 45 days with varying um, durations of bleeding. Um, and there can be some level of irregularity um, for those periods for the first one to two years after menarche, which is that first period. When we start to hear about abnormal menstrual cycle is when an athlete reports no period by the age of 15. So that's one definition of amenorrhea. No breast development by 13, menstrual cycles of less than 21 or more than 45 days, bleeding for less than two or more than seven, day, seven days, or um, very he heavy or painful periods. 
to complicate matters more, there is a spectrum of menstrual cycle disturbances that may not be fully transparent um, or fully apparent because um, an athlete is having um, a menstrual cycle every month. And so um, at the normal side or a normal scale, an athlete can present, um, can have ovulatory cycles where ovulation is occurring and the cycle is not changed. However, where things start to change is at these levels um, where there could be effects of luteal phase and luteal phase defects. And I realized that I did not include in this very large slide deck um, some of the, the actual phases of the menstrual cycle. But um, if we want to, if you want to get some more details, I probably could whip that up really quickly later. Um, and then there are levels of anovulation where there is um, no evidence of ovulation, but the length of, of the cycle um, may not change. Um, and then an athlete may ha have some degree of um, either what formerly was called oligomenorrhea. I got corrected by a gynecologist when I was co-presenting um, a couple months ago, um, and she uses um, the the word uh, the phrase abnormal uterine bleeding um, with menses occurring in cycles of 36 to 90 days, but are inconsistent and unpredictable. And then secondary amenorrhea, where there's no menses for three months or greater than 90 days. So that's what this athlete had was um, secondary amenorrhea. And fortunately, and something that we need to be aware of is these athletes are starting to come to clinic for just that reason. And I think that's something that we as um, sports medicine physicians can handle and can have that conversation. So I definitely did some education to my schedulers that say, yes, schedule these patients. Um, interestingly, um, I loved this, this breakdown of um, this figure on the iceberg of menstrual dysfunction. And it kind of breaks down based on that spectrum where we think about amenorrhea, which is kind of the tip of the iceberg where these athletes are presenting. But then there's also this ologomenorrhea or that abnormal uterine, um, abnormal um, uterine bleeding. Yes, I even have to go back and reference it myself. Abnormal uterine bleeding, um, which then can lead to anovulation. And this has varying levels of um, estrogen and progesterone fluctuations. And I think as we start to get more research on this in this area, we'll have a better understanding and a better, better handle on how best to intervene and work with those athletes to help them, them understand what their um, true menstrual cycle is really looking at and how that may affect their injury risk, how that may affect their performance. But where I wanted to go next was actually just break down and help differentiate polycystic ovarian syndrome and functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which are two conditions that can be a little confusing. We probably reviewed it at some point in med school, get, we hear about it, but I think it's really nice to relook at um, the difference and the overlap between the two. So down to some science, we're gonna talk about functional hypothalamic amenorrhea to start. So there are various triggers for functional, or I'm just going to say FHA for to, to spare the mouthful for FHA, which can include stress, weight loss, or even um, just excessive or an increase in exercise. And that can lead to a suppression of gonadotropin releasing hormones, that D GNRH, and um, specifically to suppression of the pulsatility of that hormone. And that can lead to um, effects on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis right there. Um, and that can lead to elevations or increases in cortisol secretion. It al also can lead to disturbances of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, leading to sometimes suppression um, or low normal levels of thyrotropin. So that's that TSH and then an increased level of reverse T3 and a low level of T3. So we'll be talking about low T3 um, frequently throughout this. And then you can see the suppression specifically on the estradiol level um, from that um, hypothalamic um, pituitary gonadal axis. And then you can also see some effects on leptin, um, which is a regulate, which can regulate hypothalamic dysfunction. Switching gears, looking at polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, this is due to an excess of ovarian androgen sec secretion. And this can be um, related to um, a genetic predisposition. And also they have, um, these athletes have features of um, polycystic um, ovaries. So this raised androgen level affects the pituitary LH secretion. And you can see a unique distinction where this um, has elevated levels of luteinizing hormone compared to the lower levels of luteinizing hormone in the um, FHA. 
And this also can lead to anovulation, which um, is an important area and um, an, a concern um, for fertility um, for athletes down the road. Um, this hyperandrogenism can also affect insulin sensitivity and secretion. And there can also be outside genetic and dietary factors that also play a role in this. And um, this can overall, that's the most common endocrine disorder in women of fertile age at around 10%. Um, and it's common in elite female athletes. Some of these athletes, um, since there is um, elevations or higher testosterone levels, they can see um, that they may be um, more advantageous or it may be a performance benefit for them in specific sports. So the most commonly used criteria to diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome is the Rotterdam criteria. Um, I did um, look and see that there's a couple of other criteria, the NIH criteria and the androgen excess and PCOS society criteria. Um, you can see this breakdown and, and something that um, personally, this is kind of where I would say, if I see an athlete with clinical and or biomechanical features of hyperandrogenism, I'm probably going to, based on um, those, those features, refer to an endocrinologist so that way they can decide if an ultrasound is absolutely necessary or if additional um, interventions um, are needed because there are differences between the treatments for PCOS versus FHA. So where should we start in our clinics? Um, so proposed lab workup for functional hypothalamic amenorrhea or amenorrhea that can also help distinguish um, between FHA and PCOS would be getting a serum TSH and free T4 to look for any thyroid dysfunction or thyroid abnormalities, um, getting a prolactin level specifically to rule out hyperprolactinemia, getting an LH, FSH, estradiol, those sex hormones, um, also could get anti-malarian hormone. Um, this has been um, explored as a possible diagnostic marker for PCOS. Um, it's not in the um, criteria as of yet, um, I think partly due to variability in um, just a the types of um, lab assessments that are available for um, different groups. If there's concern for a clinical hyperandrogenism, so this could be an athlete who presents with acne, hirsutism, um, male pattern alopecia, clitoromegaly, or other hyperinsulinism states, um, then additional labs such as total testosterone and DHEAS could be explored. This also could be something you can work with the um, endocrinologist on too, so they make sure that you order the right, the right labs. And this is not to be not to be read, but I did want to share um, some other potential etiologies of amenorrhea that is just really important to um, take into account. An athlete could be pregnant, so another thing that may either um, be that should be explored um, and either tested within your clinic or encouraged to be tested outside is um, a pregnancy test. And then there are a number of other conditions based on a couple of other factors that um, it's warrants it's own lecture in and of itself, but I think the heavy hitters are really looking um, at um, thyroid, PCOS, other hyperandrogenetic, hyperandro, oh my gosh, hyperandrogenic states <laughs> um, to, to really help you navigate and where, where um, the athlete should go next. So I liked this breakdown looking at some of the features of FHA and PCOS. Um, so both can have some feature of amenorrhea or other menstrual irregularity. And um, interestingly, the feature of BMI, um, like this athlete who came into our clinic, her BMI was normalized. She did have a history of FHA, and um, then she um, presented more with some more PCOS features. Some of the big um, distinguishing characteristics are these androgens um, specifically. So um, suppressed androgens in FHA and increased androgens in PCOS. Also, um, as I had mentioned, increased LH levels and LH pulse frequency is another distinguishing factor between the two. And you can see some other um, specifics related to um, endometrial um, thickness and cortisol response and um, also insulin levels. And I think that what's interesting when I was reading a little bit more about um, just bone health in PCOS is that there can be um, suppression of bone mineral density. And specifically, um, don't try and read this and look at this breakdown, but there are a lot of different factors as far as how that cascade of hormonal irregularities could really affect overall bone mineral density. And so I think um, in our athlete population, we usually see decreased bone mineral density more so in that functional hypothalamic amenorrheic patient or athlete. But 
I think we really need to um, keep in mind that if this athlete does have features or does have a history or presents with PCOS, it's being managed that these um, that bone mineral density um, should be considered as far as um, just overall overall bone health in the future. Here's another just breakdown as far as some of those lab features and lab differences in a nice nice chart form so you can see them a little more clearly. Um, specifically, um, the ones that are a little more clear without the flat line because um, estradiol can be confusing um, and some can um, have, have normal estradiol. And so these, these numbers can be a little bit more variable, especially at the level of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea that the athlete presents with. Um, but you can see again, um, right, that LH um, is decreased and um, increased in the PCOS. And I am going to, oh, great. Thanks, Melody. Okay. And so what is also really important, and I think this is why it's important for us to understand and distinguish between these two, is that the treatment is quite, is different um, for PCOS versus functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Um, both involve um, lifestyle ma management um, and some different education. Um, however, sometimes for um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea cases, they actually need to really reduce their activity levels and mod make some modifications. And that's not often the case with an PCOS. Um, if there is overlap between PCOS and FHA, which can also really complicate things, and I don't want to get too deep into like the um, the nuances there, but maybe that athlete needs to actually make some nutritional modifications first and then get into um, a regular physical activity routine. Another interesting um, difference is that um, in FHA, um, oral contraceptives are, are not advised um, for a number of reasons, but previously the thought was that um, oral contraceptive pills could help improve bone mineral density in athletes with FHA that had impaired bone health. Um, however, that's um, been really been refuted or the, the new research on this is, is very um, um, unrevealing of any, any benefit from the oral contraceptive pills. Um, further, uh, based on the level of um, metabolic risk, metformin could be used and other treatments for fertility can be considered. Um, however, for athletes with prolonged amenorrhea, one thing that can be considered and oftentimes discussed with an uh, um, endocrinologist is transdermal estrogen plus cyclic progesterone or progestin. And that's really for that for those athletes that you're really concerned for long-term um, bone mineral density issues. And if time, I will get into some of that those bone um, health concerns as well. Um, but just to fast forward, I want to move to the next case to keep us on track. And I've got my, my phone on. Um, so I, Melody, let me know if we need to cut it and wrap it up. So this is a case of fatigue and performance decline. An 18 year old adolescent male presents to the clinic with symptoms of fatigue. At the time of his presentation, he was running about 60 miles per week for school cross country. In addition to a bunch of cross training, he was doing kickboxing and he's also doing some other, um, other strength training. And he just feel like he's um, he just felt like he's just really been underperforming and not really hitting his marks based on all of this work that he's put in. Um, upon further inquiry in your in your um, clinic, you find out that um, this athlete also endorses low libido and also a lack of morning erections, which has been new over the um, course of this um, change in training volume. So here's another. A uh, diagram that looks at the effects of low energy availability and stressors on um, the hypothalamic pituitary axis and all these different um, all these different organ systems and those effects. Um, one thing that I think I wanted that I that I want to point out is the um, introduction of um, how testosterone can also be suppressed in this low energy availability state. And specifically in our in our male athlete population, it can be really hard to gauge and determine if they are at this low energy availability state because they don't have a menstrual cycle that that changes or is adjusted and um, could be that early indicator or um, as I'll share a little later, even an irregular period or um, a missed cycle could be even a later indicator um, for these um, low energy availability um, features. So I wanted to switch gears and talk about relative energy deficiency in sport. I'm going to um, almost assume that that someone has already is going to be speaking on this in the future. So I'm going to kind of fly through this and talk specifically about the endocrinology endocrinology components. And there, I would um, probably argue, and some people would argue that endocrinology is related to everything with REDS, but I'm going to really um, narrow it down to some specific areas. 
So um, just to get us up to speed, um, relative energy deficiency in sport can lead to physiological impairments that can affect metabolic rate, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, and um, cardiovascular um, health, as well as many other aspects of performance. As part of relative energy deficiency in sport, you can see the female athlete triad, which is comprised, comprised and this is probably also going to be um, shared, so I'll fly, um, comprised of three interrelated components, low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which we talked about as far as those different causes, and then that can affect um, variabilities of um, bone health, um, all the way from osteoporosis to more subclinical low bone mineral density, especially in our younger um, younger athlete population. I'm very careful to, to use the word osteoporosis, and um, definitely worth um, just talking about that if there's time, and just um, what we really consider low bone mineral density for, for these athletes. Going a step beyond, um, recently there have been um, some consensus statements that have been published on the male athlete triad, which uh, instead of the irregular um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, male athletes can present with functional hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, however, the research has shown that there's usually more extreme cases of low energy availability that that athlete needs to reach to get to that level of hormonal suppression. And again, um, that can lead to impaired bone health, including um, effects on um, overall um, increasing risk for bone stress injury or stress reactions and stress fractures. So I wanted to go and dive a little bit more deeply into some of these circles, just so that um, you understand some of those relationships with an understanding that I want to get into the more of the clinical um, meat of it all and not fly too much into all the, all the research. So um, research has shown that there's been a um, dose response relationship between low energy availability and the severe of low, severity of low energy availability and luteinizing hormone pulsatility and um, suppressed estrogen. And the findings, all, the research also shows with more severe or prolonged energy deficits, it can lead to more of those extreme and amenorrhea cases or menstrual irregularity cases, which is why um, oftentimes we don't see. And so there's all those kind of more subclinical um, below, the, below the surface, um, just the tip of the iceberg um, presentations. There's a lot of research on bone health and impaired bone health um, due to low energy availability. Um, research has shown that um, specifically amenorrheic athletes have lower bone mineral density, impaired bone microarchitecture, reduced estimates of bone strength, and higher rates of fracture compared with eumenorrheic athletes and non-athletic controls. And the thought is a um, number of different ways to um, really affect that bone remodeling process, but one big one is that suppression of hormones, specifically kind of the, big, um, the big key player would be the um, estrogen deficiency component. When looking at low energy availability in bone and some of the research, there's um, the short-term effects of altered bone me metabolism favoring resorption, and then the long-term effects can affect other aspects of bone microarchitecture leading to downregulated bone formation. And these, um, as I would mentioned, are combined from both estrogen and other low energy effects on other organs, specifically growth hormone like IGF-1, leptin, and total T3. Um, just so we're on the same page about bone stress injuries and stress fractions, stress reactions, I just put, put this in for um, kind of a, a shameless plug for just um, good uh, terminology. So a bone stress injury is an overuse injury that develops in response to repetitive load applied to generally normal bone. Um, it can be a stress fracture, which is um, when bone stress injuries have a radiographically, radiologically visible sclerosis or fracture line or a stress reaction, which is probably what we're seeing more so in our, in our clinics, the, the tibial stress reaction without the fracture line, um, that um, can have a variability of um, gradient systems, which I'm sure I'm gonna reference the bone stress injury lecture that hopefully is, is being done or will be done in the future. And then interestingly, slightly different is the insufficiency fracture, which is when a bone injury um, results from loads within the normal range, um, but it's applied to an abnormal bone or a bone with abnormal biology. And I use insufficiency fractures or think about those when an athlete may have um, some other bone syndrome or condition that predisposes them to um, low bone mineral density that they've been um, kind of born with or, or dealing, um, dealing with for a number of years. 
Um, really quick to keep us on time, we see a cumulative effect of triad risk factors on bone stress injury risk in exercise girls and women. Um, hence the importance of really understanding the terminology and understanding that triad risk and how it can affect future bone stress injury risk. We also see changes in bone microarchitecture, um, like um, I mentioned before, but the research does show that increased bone stress injury risk. And then um, specifically regarding the types of bone stress injuries, um, menstrual irregularities was noted in 75% of female athletes with bone stress injuries at trabecular rich bone sites. So the one that we think about the most with a trabecular rich bone site would be like the femoral neck compared to 12.5% of those at cortical rich sites. And so that cortical rich is more like in the tibia. So um, other potential health effects of REDS include um, this cascade of endocrine effects. I'm going to reference this um, beautifully done and very detailed endocrine effects of REDS, um, which have um, Kirsty and Kate and um, Dr. Tenforti, who's also um, was a fellow before me, um, and I would also consider him a mentor. So you can see those suppressed um, hormone effects, which I had mentioned earlier, um, that can um, have varying levels as, as far as when they're presented and which specific athlete populations they're more common. The um, research, interestingly, is a little bit more mixed as far as testosterone suppression and functional hypothalamic amenorrhea or females, um, but um, research is fairly strong in the in male athletes. Um, back to looking at just metabolism and looking at um, the suppressed metabolism, I think this is important to consider that athletes may have almost a plateau of weight, weight loss. Um, they may um, lose a little bit weight of weight at first, but that metabolism starts to slow down to um, accommodate and match the, um, that low energy um, availability. And that um, weight loss may be less than what would be expected for um, their level of overall energy intake. Um, so iron deficiency also interacts um, from a hematological standpoint, and um, I find this one interesting that it can um, play a role in um, overall metabolic fuel availability. Um, I'll get into this a little bit more, but um, it also affects thyroid function. And so I think making sure that an athlete isn't not iron deficient before addressing or exploring any um, thyroid um, thyroid deficiencies or thyroid um, dysfunction is, is a nice um, pearl and um, something that I've, I've learned to really explore and make sure that I'm, if when I'm getting thyroid tests, I'm also exploring if there's any iron deficiency that could also be almost perpetuating or potentiating um, some of these other, other factors and other risks. And lastly, um, there's um, effects on overall growth hormone with slowing of linear growth. Um, there's decreases in IGF-1 um, due to increases in growth hormone and increased growth hormone resistance. And this is um, mainly noted, or the research is mainly in the um, anorexia nervosa um, research. Um, so early detection of low energy availability is essential. Um, I like this breakdown. I, I made this, so I'll, I'll take I'll take ownership for it. probably the inaccuracies as far as the subtleties of this. Is this one week or is this weeks to months or is it months to years? But I think it's nice to see that the breakdown is these athletes may not to present with amenorrhea may have had a state of low energy availability, availability for a longer period of time than you would expect. And these bone mineral changes in bone stress injuries may take a while. So a lot of these athletes that I see in high school may not get those bone stress injuries until that first or second year of college, which can be really frustrating, um, especially when they're increasing their volume. They're just um, putting themselves at greater risk from a lot of different um, levels and angles. Interestingly, also, as far as reversing some of these issues, the bone mineral density changes can take longer to, to address and reverse. So um, some non-pharmacologic treatment strategies for REDS, which I think is um, really important to talk about some different um, ways to um, approach this in your clinic. Um, first and foremost, addressing low energy availability with um, ideally um, an interdisciplinary team, a sports dietitian. Um, I'm just gonna fast forward to one more slide um, with this very um, complex, but I like the, the level of detail with the treatment approach and where you're combining nutrition, psychology, um, considering the different, the of some of the physiologic effects and, and working with the medical team and really having that athlete and um, ideally the coach as kind of that um, more so the, the athlete at that center of this conversation. So they, they feel empowered, empowered and they understand why these um, different um, recommendations and treatment strategies are being taken. 
Um, so things that um, some quick hitters as far as tips is really having the athlete think about um, carbohydrate intake specifically as far as as they're working on increasing their overall energy intake and caloric intake. There has been um, research and more research that's looking at low carbohydrate availability, leading to some of these reds features and other hormonal features. So I think that's an important um, piece. And I think a lot of my athletes, even though um, a lot of these athletes are endurance athletes, are just really active in a lot of different um, in a lot of different activities that they can still be under carbine and not getting enough carbohydrates throughout the day. So really I'm um, trying to encourage that and um, get them to be creative with the amount of uh, the types of carbs that they go for. Addressing within day energy deficits, not skipping meals um, seems really clear and obvious, but these athletes, especially when they're um, very, um, very overscheduled, uh, it um, can be hard for them to get those um, meals in. And then another um, important area is really considering um, fiber intake and consider even reducing fiber intake for these athletes who feel full faster and that um, fiber intake may actually be decreasing their ability to get enough calories throughout the day. So I know there's a lot of benefits of fiber, so I'm not saying um, throw out fiber completely, but maybe I'm um, being just mindful of how much fiber that athlete's getting. Um, just really quickly on this, um, addressing the low energy availability, um, it is possible to increase energy availability without reducing training volume, but is that the best approach? Is that going to lead to um, delays in that final final care and management plan? And really, um, really hitting home that mental health is health and that understanding that um, interplay and the why of why that athlete may be in that place um, is super important. Is this just pu purely unintentional? Is this athlete just need to take out the kick, the male athlete need to take out the kickboxing or the other activity and that, that's enough to, to get them back into that energy balance state um, potentially. And then just a shout out to the Reds cat, um, which can help you break down and maybe help provide some guidance too, as far as um, features that are a definite, definite stop, no start, red light. And I think this is a really important pearl as far as guidance and clinical features um, or clinical guidance tools and guidelines to help, um, help us make the appropriate decisions that are going to help that athlete stay as active as possible, but also as safely as possible. And you can see the breakdown between um, red light, yellow light, and green light and just um, teaser that there is um, a red screening update that will be happening um, by the IO International Olympic Committee um, consensus group. I'm not involved in it, but I've um, heard, heard through the grapevine through um, some of my colleagues, and it's um, really exciting that there could be a more of an expansion and potentially another color, color orange. So for the sake of just getting to the last um, bit, I'm going to leave this as a teaser of um, this possible exercise hypogonadal male condition. Um, Dr. Hackney has been um, studying this um, for quite a while and really asking this question of, is there an adaptive, almost more um, functional method of, um, or functional type of hypogonadism that has led to adaptation as far as um, baseline testosterone? And um, I think, the bottom line is more research is needed on male athletes on a lot of these different levels to see um, what the level of um, fueling is and caloric intake is and how that can really affect their performance, their overall risk of other injuries, including bone stress injuries. Um, the last um, case that I'm going to um, present to you is the case of the tired, cold runner. Um, this um, 20, a 22-year-old female runner um, presents um, with fatigue, performance decline, cold intolerance, and irregular periods. Um, her um, initial labs um, that were um, presented um, to you, um, she had a, a low total T3 and her TSH was normal. She's asking you about thyroid replacement and medication. Um, some of um, she's been reading about it and feels like that, that might really be helpful um, to, to get her over this hump with her um, fatigue and um, performance issues. And so um, briefly, I'm going to touch on thyroid disorders. Again, um, it's, it's getting into that. What do we need to know as um, sports medicine physicians when we're caring for our athletes? So a little thyroid 101, the thyroid, thyroid gland produces two active hormones, um, thyroxine, which is T4, and triiodothyronine, which is T3. Um, this is uh, a, the thyroid axis works on a negative feedback loop mechanism to maintain this um, beautiful homeostasis of circulating levels of thyroid hormone. And um, this is controlled by TSH, um, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, also known as um, thyroid tropin. And that um, helps control um, release of um, and release and management of T3 and T4. And again, back to that negative feedback loop. So thyroid um, works as a regulator 
um, it regulates basal metabolism, body temperature, heart rate, protein synthesis, um, carbohydrate and fat metabolism, skeletal muscle, bioenergetics, and myogenesis and repair. So hypothyroidism affects one in 300 Americans. Um, Hashimoto's thyroid Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common cause in the U.S. There are other congenital um, causes, including congenital abnormalities, iodine deficiency, infiltrative processes, um, such as amyloidosis and lymphoma. This is all part of this primary thyroid dysfunction. Um, this diagnosis is based off of um, elevated TSH and decreases in free T4. Um, there's also a subclinical um, hypothyroidism picture that shows a less elevated TSH and normal free T4, um, something that may um, come up um, with um, further conversation. And as um, the research evolves is different cutoffs for TSH and how that can affect um, the threshold for when um, thyroid therapy um, could be beneficial. Um, but the treatment is often lifelong thyroid hormone therapy that's uh, managed um, by an endocrinologist. What's challenging with hypothyroidism is the overlap for an athlete who may um, also be training really hard. And are they fatigued because of um, hypo hypothyroidism or are they fatigued because they're at um, during a, in a heavy training block? Um, other symptoms include weight gain, constipation, mood disturbances, bradycardia also can be hard for an athlete who um, may have um, just a physiologic physiologic lower heart rate. Um, other aspects, this menstrual irregularities can be from, be from a number of um, different causes. And then um, dry skin, hair loss, muscle weakness and cramping, and then cold intolerance. Overall, the prevalence of thyroid disorders in athletes is unknown. However, this survey on uh, 1,222 female runners observed that 12.2% had been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Um, there wasn't any real features as far as hypo versus non-hypothyroid um, based on training. So it wasn't like the hypothyroid athletes were trained into that low, um, that um, hypothyroid state. Um, however, the interesting finding was that one feature was the risk of diagnosis was threefold higher in those who began running before the age of 10. So I think that that um, could be a little more challenging to kind of get deep into the weeds. Were they running just doing just running, or were they running in addition to other sports? But it kind of goes along with the, our recommendations to avoid early sports specialization um, in these in these athletes, or not in all athletes, especially with running. Um, another condition that is probably seen more frequently in athletes, but is less diagnosed or underdiagnosed is euthyroid six syndrome. Um, also can, is called low T3 syndrome or non-thyroid illness. Um, this is condition is often associated with nutritional deprivation or some, some type of illness. And the early stages show a low T3 state that can then lead to a high T4 state and then a low T4 state. So sometimes these uh, um, individuals only present with um, abnormalities in their um, T3. In the athlete population, this can be seen with low energy availability or in the more severe cases, anorexia nervosa, overtraining, post-surgical stress. Um, I think it's also important to, to factor in and, and address these underlying issues before considering um, thyroid replacement or even that even going into that conversation. Uh, I oftentimes will use T3 specifically as I'm tracking an athlete who is in that REDS or low energy availability state. It's not a perfect um, value. And I think there are some fluctuations and um, there, there are fluctuations throughout the day. I mean, you saw the axis as far as um, when the best time to test those, those athletes and what they're maybe doing before or after you definitely don't want to get a lab draw right after they do a hard, heavy, heavy workout. Um, but the research does show that um, the same study um, that I had presented earlier, as far as um, LH pulsatility, those athletes that had more severe reductions or lower um, lower amounts of energy availability had um, greater reductions in T3 levels. And you can see that breakdown as far as this is the amount of um, calories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day and um, that relationship with their um, T3 levels. And then similarly, the amenorrheic athletes had a much lower um, ath lower levels than the eumenorrheic athletes versus um, eumenorrheic um, sedentary women. Um, shifting gears to hyperthyroidism, there's um, an overall lower prevalence of hyperthyroidism um, affecting about 1.3% of the population. Um, most common causes are um, toxic goiter, Graves' disease, or a thyroid adenoma. Um, 
different presenting symptoms, um, again, fatigue, um, but weight loss um, with heat intolerance, um, muscle weakness, um, potentially tremors, um, tachycardia, menstrual irregularities. Um, for these athletes, interestingly, um, presenting with, um, for Graves' disease especially, there can be um, different um, eye, eye issues. Exophthalmos is kind of the the pathognomonic um, feature of Graves' disease. Um, and the overall diagnosis is through decreased TSH with elevated T4 levels. And um, oftentimes um, follow-up would be a radioactive uptake and scan of the thyroid. Again, this is more so done by the endocrinologist. I wouldn't say that I would feel comfortable kind of going down that, that workup for hyper, hyperthyroidism, but it's really important to be able to, when an athlete does have some of these features of tachycardia or um, that, um, that tremor or menstru um, heat intolerance that to, you're thinking about getting that TSH level to get that, um, get that workup started. And then treatment um, is based on either symptom control um, and based on the, the specific diagnosis and the underlying etiology. Um, really interestingly, as far as what are the exercise effects of hypo versus hyperthyroidism, um, different um, findings as far as um, increased fracture risk and hypothyroid um, can be found, um, overall muscle weakness, and even potential increased risk of um, rhabdo. So these are, these are findings as far as as you're caring for an athlete who does have hypothyroid, making sure that their, their medications are optimized and managed and their levels are, are, are managed um, well, so they don't fall into these, um, these risks or these features that could um, affect their exercise and their overall just ability to um, perform at their best and also just on um, their overall health risks. And uh, more so in hyperthyroidism, some of these um, some of these findings, especially arrhythmias, could be um, a very um, significant or concern, concern as overall health. And so being really um, proactive and, and thinking about that when an athlete does present um, with some of those um, presenting features. And then I already talked about iron deficiency and thyroid disorder, um, but those with iron deficiency have a twofold to fivefold increase in likelihood of hypothyroidism. And this appears to induce hypothyroidism. So really making sure that you're thinking about the iron deficiency and the thyroid um, dysfunction um, in a relationships. And I am almost done. So um, thyroid replacement in the athlete, I'm gonna um, hold off on getting into this, um, this conversation, but I just wanted to kind of go back to when I would consider referral to an endocrinology if an athlete has clinical or bio biochemical features of um, PCOS, so lab features of PCOS, um, considering other hormonal replacement therapies, um, specifically if you're going to go down that transdermal estrogen route for an athlete with functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, having that conversation about the pros and the cons and have other um, potential interventions been exhausted. And then be um, really, and if there's concern for a thyroid dysfunction, specifically abnormal TSH, um, be wary of patients who present with an enlarged painful thyroid gland, especially with those signs or symptoms of thyrotoxicosis, so fever, tachycardia, tremor, and increased warmth of the skin um, to make sure that that athlete gets um, a full workup and addressed um, appropriately. So I think we've got like 10-ish minutes to get into um, some some Q and A and um, some potential questions that I thought could be helpful. And I am not a test writer, so or a test question writer. So if these aren't great questions um, or if they're confusing questions, we could talk through them too. Thankfully, this isn't um, for your for your um, boards exam per se, but we want to get you prepared. Okay. So it looks like Andy's on top of it. Oh, nice. I'm getting to the questions, Melody. Okay, the following are treatments for prolonged functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, except the always confusing except question. And it added prolonged for a reason. Should, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. We'll give it in about another. Mm. And Georgia, I'll answer your question as part of this, like. All right, good job. Okay, so um, correct. I actually didn't have an answer slide. The, but the, the an correct answer is um, that we do not recommend oral contraceptive pills as a treatment for functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. George, you actually raised a very good, um, asked a very good question as far as what if an athlete is, um, what if an athlete is on a um, oral contraceptive pill, what do you tell them? 
And I think this is a really confusing question for athletes. And it's a little bit nuanced because I think you kind of want to find out why they were placed on these, um, why they're, why they're placed on these, these, the pill in the first place, if they were placed on the pill for fun, for irregular periods or missed periods, then chatting with the athlete and say, Hey, maybe we need to go off of it and see, see what your natural, um, natural hormones and, um, what your cycle does off the, off the pill. But if they're on it for other purposes, then having the conversation of, all right, let's think about ways to, uh, um, other, other ways to optimize your, um, overall energy intake. And then I sometimes use, um, thyroid tests to help me see, is their T3 low? Could that be an early indicator of, or an indicator of low energy availability? So I hope that's, um, hope that's helpful. So in and of itself, OCPs are not harmful, but they're not helpful for bone health. So an athlete shouldn't be taking OCPs for bone health. Okay. Let's see, did I change it? Yes. Um, a distinguishing feature between FHA, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea and PCOS is... This one's a little could throw people off a little bit. Danielle, are you talking about like higher dose estrogen pills being better or more harmful for, um, better. Yeah. I know that's what I've heard too, as far as like the low dose estrogen really having very minimal to no, um, no benefits and effects. And, but I, I have, I'm aware of the conversation, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm, um, super well-versed on what the, what the verdict is and what the, what the right answer is for the debate. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. This one is one that I want, I, I figured there might be some questions. So I think the best answer, and this is kind of back to that, like, oh, the best answer versus the right answer would be a luteinizing hormone. And the differences between luteinizing hormone and a PCOS state, more elevated FHA, more um, suppressed um, BMI can be variable. An athlete may um, with FHA have a, a lower BMI, but again, with, with variabilities. And I think BMI is just, is just challenging for a number of reasons thinking about muscle mass, thinking about um, other aspects of an athlete's BMI that could make it more skewed or difficult to use as, as a metric. So I, I think that um, the best answer for this one would be um, B luteinizing hormone. Um, and then last one, um, what is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the United States? This isn't probably as yeah, athlete specific, so sorry, but um, I think it's it's one that hopefully I shared easily enough. I don't think depot as is used as frequently, but you know, I had an athlete just a few weeks ago that was um, recommended to go on um, go on an on an implant that I didn't really get into as far as the different types of hormonal contraception. And that one does, um, has been shown to have negative, um, negative effects on overall bone mineral density. So I try to discourage that. Nice. Hashimoto's is most common in the, um, for the general population. I don't know if we have research on the athlete population though. So that is Ah, uh, ooh, <laughs> Danielle, you're asking the, the the hard questions. You know, I I am prescribing transdermal estrogen. I think this is this is probably a really good conversation that as as a group collectively, like what is what is our protocol and our recommendation for this? I think for um athletes that are really really um at at such a deficit. I mean, I'm I'm very conservative as far as the prescribing of transdermal estrogen, and this one. Her um, bone mineral density was in the like negative, great less than negative 2.5. Um, she had been amenorrheic for several years. She and I had a very important, com like a very hard conversation about nutritional rehab and recovering from um, her her disordered eating. Actually, she's she's she still has some disordered eating tendencies, but she's going through a nutritional. Um, she's working with our sports dietitian as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. ICL. Um, transdermal specifically for bone mineral density. Yeah. 
And we didn't get into the, the research that specifically shows that the um, improvements in um, overall bone mineral density, Dr. Ackerman has done some work um, with um, some of her um, um, Madhu over in at Harvard, um, Boston Children's. And so there's um, some good research that we could probably dive into like a full bone health lecture on. I think I may have missed one question about workup for bone stress injuries. So my threshold um, for bone stress injury workup is if an athlete is presenting with multiple bone stress injuries or a high risk bone stress injury. So um, a, a bone stress injury at a trabecular rich site, specifically femoral neck, or something doesn't add up. The amount of volume that that athlete had done to get the bone stress injury doesn't seem to compute. Then I do a, I do a starting point as far as a bone health workup or an endocrine workup. And um, I will get that, um, I will get the, the free T3 and I'll also um, probably get um, TSH. I'm kind of combining your questions right now. And I, I'll get a ferritin, I'll check your check um, thyroid function too. And then it, it's a lot of it's, it depends on, are they um, having a regular menstrual cycle that's male or female? And that'll help guide as far as the level and the depth of the, the workup. And then fatigue workup, thyroid, um, I check T3 and T4, um, even if, yes, even if their TSH levels are normal. And I also will do some more workup um, regarding like ferritin levels too, because sometimes these athletes are just iron deficient. So that's why they're, they're fatigued. And we didn't even really get into it, but um, yeah, there's a whole, <laughs> and there, there were like four or five more slides on overtraining syndrome, but I'm kind of glad we didn't get into it because it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a rabbit hole that I don't think we would have been able to get out of, um, within the, within the time of 45 minutes. <laughs> um, Molly, I don't um, supplement with T3. I usually recommend, oh, I do have this one. Um, let's see, where is it at? Oh, um, <laughs> why there's a, I mean, in the bodybuilding and, um, kind of strength training world, um, there's a lot of talk about supplementation with T3. Um, I don't, um, because of these potential adverse effects, um, hard to manage and monitor. Um, a lot of these whys are, are refuted. The research, um, a lot of the, the explanations are hotly debated on Reddit, but not really in the, in the literature. So, um, don't say that these don't take these and um, think that those are the, um, the effects and why you would want to, but this is why people think that they want to, um, supplement with, um, T3. All right. Thanks for asking a question that I actually had a slide on. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. And we've got one minute to spare for some holiday lights. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kraus. That was wonderful. Um, that was amazingly fantastic and quite the whirlwind. But if you guys think you missed anything, Andy was recording, so you'll be able to watch it back. I think something that you started with, which was great for me as somebody who's been in practice for a bit, is that oligomenorrhea is no longer the term that now we're trying to use. You said it was um, irregular yeah. menstrual bleeding is the appropriate. Yeah, abnormal, abnormal uterine bleeding is what um, Chim Semaleka, I'm going to give her that that credit, um, but she she corrected me in a, in a talk. And I was like, thank you. I always want to be humbled and corrected and be learning new terms because new terms are happening all the time, like bone stress injury, stress reactions, stress fractures. Yeah. And it's, I think something that it's unfortunate that people are still practicing that, um, you should, it's okay to have, I, I had a dancer come in who's had two stress fractures and their pediatrician had told, told them it was okay for her to have abnormal bleeding because she's a dancer. And that happened just this year. So people are still sharing that. So definitely keep that in mind when you're treating patients. But um, also make sure that you guys are paying attention to that, uh, what Dr. Krause said about taking uh, contraceptives. Because if you are screening for a female athlete triad and you're asking somebody if they get regular periods and they say yes, then you want to find out, are they on oral contraceptives because they might be just getting withdrawal bleeding. So that's just a good pro tip for those of you that do pre-participation exams or see a lot of athletes, make sure you're asking that follow-up question. Do you have any other things like that, Dr. Krause, you think about that, you know, you know what to kind of ask when you're seeing somebody? Yeah, I think that one's, that one's a big one is um, regular periods. And then they're, then they share that they're on OCPs. And then I think the follow-up question of why they were placed on um, birth control pills in the first place is always helpful. And half the time it's half the time they don't remember, they don't know. 
Um, some other ones uh, asking about diet. Uh, we didn't really get into the types of diets that an athlete's um, practice, but I have a lot of younger athletes that are practicing veganism or vegetarian diet. And so just the ability to get a lot of those nutrients and how those nutrients can potentially interplay and affect thyroid function and some of these other other um, hormones and um, organ systems um, can be can um, contribute and increase their risk of um, that low energy availability state or iron deficiency or both. Yeah. Do you have a way that you like to ask if they have a history of disordered eating? Because I feel like a lot of patients, especially high level athletes are very restrictive in their eating, but they don't self-identify as having an eating disorder. So I kind of try to get to it by asking if they have, are, do they have any restrictions or do they try to follow a specific diet? Um, do you, what's your pro tip for asking that question in a, you know, without a lot of that weight of that history? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. Cause it's like that, that could, that could take 10 minutes to potentially dive. So, I mean, I think a good chart review, cause sometimes you will see that they're, they had a, a stent in, um, in, in patient hospital, like they've been hospitalized or they did an IOP. So an intensive outpatient um, treatment program. So low hanging fruit, do the chart review, see what you can find there. Um, I will also see, I mean, getting vitals too, if they are on that lower, um, kind of lower heart rate, I start to ask a bit more of those questions because maybe this isn't physiologic um, bradycardia and this is uh, more concerning for low energy availability. And then, yeah, any, um, any special diets. And then sometimes with the parents, they'll be like, oh yeah, they're a really, really clean eater. And to me, I mean, I even mentioned it in our, in our talk, like when they're like, I'm a, I'm a really healthy eater. I, I kind of, a lot of these athletes they're eating too healthy. They, they need to have some more um, flexibility and, and be more relaxed with their, with their diet and not be so strict with a specific time and, and what they're eating. And sometimes if you've got the chance to like have them just talk through their, their nutrition for the, that day, like, what do you have for breakfast? And if it's like 11 and they say, oh, I, I didn't have breakfast and they are pretty nonchalant about it, then my wheels are turning that they probably don't have breakfast any morning. And this is, this is, um, potentially a problem. It is a problem, but depending on how deep of a problem. Yeah. I think that, um, the best slide today, I think the take home point was that iceberg of menstrual irregular dysfunction. That was a really good point of, we have a lot to dig into, but you did a great job. Thank you so much. I think we'll probably stop recording now. And, uh, we take, we really appreciate your time and sharing your expertise today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And yeah, you're right. This is kind of a tip of the iceberg as far as where we could go, but hopefully we covered the important areas for, um, to start. And then based on feedback, we can always do a deeper dive into certain areas. All right. Thanks for your time. Right. Thanks everyone. Have a good week.